Stanley Carnow is well known uh, to anybody interested in history, <clears throat> anybody interested in good writing. Uh, he is uh, uh, well known in his field, uh, his Pulitzer Prize winner. But before he rose to those heights, uh, he started out as a student at Harvard. And I suspect, like more than one other person in this audience, uh, took a freighter uh, to Paris uh, to spend a summer abroad. Only unlike most of us, he didn't come back for many, many years. He stayed on, uh, became a correspondent, a journalist, and uh, spent the better part of 10 years in Paris during the 1950s as that capital of that wonderful country was still recovering from the Second World War. He subsequently went on and spent another 11 years in Asia, correspondent for Time, Life, Saturday Evening Post, The, the Observer, The Washington Post, and NBC News. And from those 11 years, of course, some of his best known writings uh, resulted, as I said, his Pulitzer Prize work on the Philippines, in our image, America's empire in the Philippines, and Vietnam, a history which became a landmark uh, chronicle of, the, uh, of Vietnam and the war. Mao and China, from revolution to revolution, and Southeast Asia. He won some six ME awards for his role as chief correspondent uh, for the PBS series on Vietnam, a television history. He was a Neiman Fellow at Harvard and also a Fellow at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. So we are very pleased this evening to be able to join the author in a walk back to this fascinating part of European history. Uh, we will hear from him and then we will hear uh, his answers to our questions. And then you are all invited uh, to meet the author. Uh, in our dining room, and there, yes, there will be uh, books uh, that he will sign for you. Please join me in welcoming Stanley Carnow. Thank you, Walter. I'm, I'm thinking of hiring you as my public relations man. <laughs> uh, well, the title of the book, Paris in the 50s, uh, might better be called My Paris of the 50s. It's uh, partly a memoir, uh, but mostly a series of reports, uh, greatly edited my original reports that I wrote uh, when I was a correspondent for Time. Uh, and as I say, I, I revised them and uh, edited them down for the book. Now, one reviewer uh, complained uh, that the material in these pieces is, is dated, uh, which uh, they are. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, they reach back about 40 or 45 years. Uh, uh, I portray France uh, as it was then, not as it is today. Uh, but as you may know, the French are deeply preoccupied with tradition and continuity, or as the old adage goes, plus ça change, plus ça même chose. The more things change, the more they remain the same. So I'm inclined to agree with another and a more favorable critic who uh, observed that the, that the material uh, is still valid. Uh, as Walter mentioned, I first went to France after finishing college in June 1947, uh, June 1947 uh, aboard a cold freighter. It took us 16 days. Uh, that was a time when throngs of young Americans were sailing for Europe. Uh, it was in the period after World War II. And again, as Walter said, uh, I was only planning to stay for the summer and stayed for 10 years. Of course, the question is, why Paris? These days, uh, young people fling off to Peking and Indonesia and Tokyo. Our, our own son went off to Tokyo when he graduated from college for a year. Uh, why Paris? Well, the name alone, uh, as I need not tell you, uh, has a magical ring to it. Here is the legendary Ville Lumière, which promises something for everyone, beauty, sophistication, culture, cuisine, sex, escape, 
and that indefinable called ambiance. You may remember uh, Oscar Wilde's uh, famous quip, when good Americans die, they go to Paris. Well, that wasn't my purpose in going there. <laughs> but then what was it? Perhaps it was just uh, Paris. Uh, I guess I was uh, motivated by numbers of things. I'd uh, majored in European history and literature and at uh, Harvard, and uh, I knew something. I had a smattering of uh, the French past, the, uh, the Enlightenment, the Revolution, the Napoleonic era, uh, the, the resistance uh, during World War II uh, was very inspiring to us, even though in retrospect, we're discovering that not a, not, it was not as valiant as, uh, as the French claimed it to be. Uh, I grappled with the French classics, mostly in translation, and uh, had read, uh, dutifully read, uh, everyone from Voltaire uh, to Moliere to uh, Proust and uh, more, the more recent uh, intellectuals like Sartre and Simon de Beauvoir and Camus. Uh, in those days, we were very familiar with French movies. You may remember, again, some of the great classics like Les Enfants du Paradis and The, 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 the Baker's Wife. And I think one thing especially that, uh, uh, that intrigued us uh, was the hope of walking in the footsteps of retracing the footsteps of Hemingway and Scott Fitzgerald and sitting at the feet of Gertrude Stein. And there was, too, uh, the, the lure of the compliant French woman, you know, Mary, the doughboys of World War I sang Mademoiselle from Armentier, Parlez-vous, and of course the GIs who came back uh, from Europe uh, in, uh, after World War II, to, you know, sang the praises of uh, French girls. Unfortunately, I served in Asia, uh, in India during World War II. So those were all the attractions. and. Uh, uh, that uh, brought me there in the first place. Uh, and at first, uh, when I got there, I plunged into a feverish tour of the city, uh, taking in all the familiar sites like Notre Dame and the, the Louvre, the Eiffel Tower, and so forth. And soon I slowed my pace and became a flaneur. A uh, flaneur is uh, not an easy word to translate. I suppose uh, you might say uh, I was a stroller. And t Paris is a marvelous walking city or a strolling city. Uh, and I think I, I crisscrossed it that in the first uh, few weeks I was there. I went through every street. Uh, and I'd meander along the Seine and browse in the bookstalls and gaze at the barges uh, that were cruising up and down the river. Uh, the street names, uh, which uh, fascinated me then, and I've just been back recently, and they still do fascinate me, are a kind of necrology of famous and forgotten uh, French artists, uh, authors, composers, politicians, soldiers, diplomats, clergymen. And oddly enough, uh, in France, which is largely anti-clerical, uh, the multi multitudes of streets are named for saints, uh, male and female. And every time you turn around, there's a boulevard saint such and such, or parks and, and streets and avenues are named for saints. Uh, this, uh, the naming of streets for saints was one of the ways I began to learn a bit about how the French judged uh, th their uh, figures of the past. I mean, who's up and who's down? Uh, one way to judge it was looking at the street names. Uh, and I was a little bit baffled by how the choices, uh, the selection was made. Uh, I mean, why would it be that uh, Louis XVI, who was guillotined, would have a square name for him? Uh, I don't know the answer, to tell you the truth. I mean, why were the mistresses of Louis XIV, Madame de Montespan and Madame de Maintenon, why, are they, why do they have streets uh, named for them? Uh, on the other hand, uh, Robespierre, you know, who the architect of the terror during the Revolution, is totally forgotten. Uh, and an odd one is that Napoleon has no street name for him, or even an alley. Uh, you do have, you know, Les Invalides, where he's buried, his tomb rests in this glorious building with the dome. Uh, but Napoleon himself is, is not remembered in, in a street name. Uh, on the other hand, Bonaparte, 
has a street name for him. Now there you get into some of the, the, the nuances of the French, right? They, they named the street Bonaparte because Bonaparte, the general, uh, saved France uh, at the end of the revolution by defending France against the European coalition. Napoleon went on to, to betray uh, the revolution by crowning himself emperor, so he's been forgotten uh, in terms of street names anyway. Uh, Paris in those days, uh, just after the war, was terribly poor. Uh, the buildings were in disrepair. Uh, there was rationing. And as, even as a foreigner, one had to line up uh, outside the mairie. The mairie is the administrative building of each arrondissement, each district. And uh, <coughs> you had to line up and, and get ration tickets for, uh, for butter, for cheese, uh, for coupons for clothes, for textiles. And there were these little old ladies. Very often they were war widows who were given the sinecure of, of uh, doling out these uh, ration tickets. And uh, this was an early whiff of, uh, I've had the theory that when I'm, up until almost recently, France was still in the 19th century. Uh, and these little old ladies would sit at tables and they'd clip out these coupons with scissors and they had pots of glue and they'd glue them into your books. And you had these interminable lines, you'd wait all day long to get your month's rations. Uh, but at the same time, there was a sort of, uh, the French, uh, another word I think that describes the French is the débrouillard. They're, they're terrifically good manipulators. They somehow can get by. Um, and uh, as you sat on a cafe terrace, you know, looking, for example, at the traffic, uh, it was a peculiar collection of contraptions, uh, many of them cars that were run on charcoal or kerosene, tricycles, horse carts. Uh, uh, and somehow they made do. Uh, they did more than make do in many instances. You have men who would, uh, the men would take out the threadbare suits and put a little boutonniere in the lapel, and women had this way of adding a little chic to their uh, shabby dresses, uh, however they did it. Uh, so uh, there was a, a kind of not a, it was poor, but not unpleasant. If I mean, you didn't feel a grinding poverty. Uh, uh, one, of course, as, he, as a virile young man, I was I couldn't help but being struck by the numbers of prostitutes in the streets. Now, uh, just uh, after the war, uh, a reformer by the name of Matri Shah had had the ridiculous idea of closing down the brothels, and uh, so all the working girls uh, were thrown out in the streets and. And they would uh, go up and down the streets. And, and again, uh, things were tacitly organized in Paris because they would just go in certain neighborhoods. They operated in certain neighborhoods. There were certain places where they didn't operate. Uh, you know, I had come from America. I still had my puritanical uh, gloss to me. And I uh, was not under any illusions that, about the prostitution in America. But, you know, in, in America, the hookers sat in the hotel lobbies uh, behind the potted palms where you couldn't see them. Uh, where in, Par in Paris, there they were out. And they were kind of, uh, there was sort of, a, again, a very pleasant kind of atmosphere. They'd stroll down the streets, they'd stop men, they'd joke with them. And uh, they had little phrases that they used, uh, you know, would you like to make a conquest this evening was one of them, for example. Uh, and uh, it was all in good humor. And you only got the feeling that, you know, for them, it was a job like any other job. Uh, well, toward the end of my summer, I uh, pondered the idea of going home, uh, but I couldn't conceive of, because uh, I couldn't conceive of living abroad for a long time, and even less that I, that I consider becoming an expatriate. Uh, but I was reluctant to leave. I'd only scratched the surface of France, and I wanted to dig deeper. And here I was uh, wrestling with the dilemma when the inevitable happened. I met a girl. And uh, so that changed my mind, or made up my mind for me, and I decided to stay at least for the foreseeable future. Uh, I'd served in World War II, which entitled me to the GI Bill. Uh, in those days, I paid $75 a month. Now today, you can barely get a dinner in Paris for $75. Uh, but in those days, when the dollar was strong, 
uh, it went a long way. And so $75, you could, uh, you could get by for a month, actually, uh, on condition. It was one condition uh, about the GI Bill, and that is that you attend school. Uh, on the other hand, there was no requirement that you go to classes. Uh, I registered at the Sorbonne, and then I spent nearly all my time hanging out at cafes uh, with my girlfriend and her friends, uh, which was not bad. I learned to speak French, and as I say, I got to know more about France than uh, I would have learned if I'd sat in a musty lecture hall. Uh, I later got married and divorced, uh, but in the meantime, uh, I had become part of a French family, uh, upper middle class intellectuals, and they taught me a lot about French society, or to be precise about it, their slice of it. Uh, I can't say that I became assimilated. Now, in France, a foreigner is always a foreigner. Uh, but I think I, it's fair to say that I became, or at least I felt it as I was becoming integrated uh, the, uh, I'd always uh, dreamt of uh, becoming a journalist. So uh, after uh, I looked around uh, Paris for a job of one sort or another with some kind of a news organization, and after a couple of years, uh, I landed a job as a gopher at the Paris Bureau of Time. Now, it was a very humble uh, beginning. Uh, I didn't particularly like it. it was it onerous, so I had to go around and interpret for uh, the full-fledged correspondents. Uh, but ultimately, I was promoted to the rank of correspondent myself. Now, the other members of the Bureau uh, concentrated primarily uh, on heavyweight stuff. Uh, you know, American global strategy in the post-war period, the future of, of Europe against the threat of the Soviet Union. You know, this was deep dish stuff, as we used to call it. Uh, but since my French by this time was fluent and I knew my way around town, uh, I was given, uh, I reported mainly on the French uh, and tried to figure out what made them tick. Uh, and I remembered uh, the instructions that Harold Ross, the first editor of The New Yorker, uh, gave to Janet Flanner when he sent her to Paris in 1925 to cover the French. He said to, the, he said to her, uh, don't tell me what you think, tell me what they think. And that uh, concept has guided me in many parts of the world. Uh, it's the challenge for a journalist, I think, is to get inside the people you're covering. So I got to do the fun stories uh, while my colleagues were doing the heavyweight stuff. Uh, and these fun stories, I think, at the same time, offered some insights into the way the French behave. And the book is mostly a collection of those stories. It's, it's, a, it's, it's almost a, a chronicle. I'd rather call it a chronicle uh, than a memoir in that respect. And here are a couple of samples of uh, some of these uh, lighter stories, which at the same time, I think, uh, tell you something about the French. Uh, for example, uh, in October uh, 1952, uh, there was a big celebration in Paris uh, for the 80th birthday of Prince Kornonsky. Now, Prince Kornonsky, uh, his real name was Maurice Sayan. He was a Frenchman uh, who'd adopted this uh, pseudonym, uh, Cournon. He dated back to the turn of the century. Cournon, uh, in Latin, means why not? He was a rather cavalier boulevardier, uh, and he liked that nickname. And because the French and the Russians were close at, the, at that period, uh, he added the, the ski. It was chic to be Slavic. Uh, at first, he started out as a uh, writing little feuilleton and light pieces for the newspapers, and, uh, and eventually uh, became uh, a professional gourmet. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he was an inspector for the Guide Michelin, you know, that little, not so little book that we use with all the stars that rates the restaurants. Uh, and he compiled the definitive uh, La Russe Gastronomique, uh, which, ran, which ran to, uh, to 28 volumes. I think it's still in print, but you can get an avail in English uh, one volume uh, uh, 
it, you can get it, it's available in one volume. Now I had the painless job of, of eating with him for a week, that, uh, that week of celebration. And I must say, it was my, the beginning of my culinary education. Uh, as befit uh, his metier, uh, Kornowski weighed about, about 350 pounds. And uh, when he would enter his favorite restaurant, uh, usually a family bistro, uh, he was treated by the owners as, the, as royalty. Uh, he would uh, get a way of talking through dinner and uh, recalling food anecdotes uh, he collected during his career. Uh, for example, uh, I remember he saying to me one night, uh, when you get to a strange town and you want to know the best place to eat, uh, consult the local doctor, the journalists, and above all, the priests. Uh, the secret of fine cuisine, he emphasized, was simplicity. The sauce should enhance the natural flavor of the ingredients, not disguise it. Uh, and in that respect, uh, when you watched him eat something like a pear, uh, it was an extraordinary experience. Uh, you know, we use, as Americans, we pick up a pear or an apple and eat it by hand. And uh, he would, he would, uh, he was like a surgeon. He would eat the pear with a knife and fork. And of course, the pears were delicious. French pears are very good. And he'd work at that pear uh, as if he was a, uh, a heart surgeon. Uh, a few years later, unfortunately, his health failed, and he was put on a diet of toast and, and milk, uh, which was too depressing for him. Uh, and so he jumped to his death from his apartment window. Uh, but before doing so, he wrote a note, a uh, suicide note to a friend, uh, cautioning, surtout, above all, avoid the left leg of the pheasant since it perches on that limb, which makes the blood circulation sluggish and the meat tough. <laughs> if I had been, well, I mean, he went on to the very end, uh, uh, exercising his profession. If I had been uh, asked to compose his uh, epitaph, I would have uh, quoted the famous adage of uh, Bria Savarin, you know, the, the great uh, gourmet of the the late 18th century, who wrote, tell me what you eat, and I will tell you who you are. Another time, uh, very much in the same vein, uh, I covered a trip down to the Beaujolais region. Uh, this trip was organized by uh, a man called Albert Frace, uh, uh, unknown, totally unknown. He was the owner of a little left bank cafe, uh, and he would take his regular customers with him every year when uh, he went to buy his wines. His, uh, this cafe was, was patronized uh, by neighborhood guys. I mean, just plumbers or carpenters. Uh, it was over in the left bank. It was near the Beaux-Arts, the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. So there were maybe an art professor. There were art dealers, uh, maybe a few writers. And, uh, and Albert had this notion that uh, he didn't want to disappoint his customers. And so take them along on the wine trip and, and, uh, and let them help choose the wines. And so we embarked on this motorcade uh, late in the year, just after the harvest. We had four or five cars, uh, or five or six cars. And we went uh, down into this region. If you know the Beaujolais it's, uh, areas, I mean, everybody knows Beaujolais. 90% uh, of what's called Beaujolais really is Algerian wine. Uh, but when you get into the real regions, you get into the specific uh, growths like Bouilly, uh, Cote de Bouilly, Julianas, uh, which is named for Julius Caesar, by the way. Um, there are nine of these. And uh, we try to cover as much as we could. And so we went, uh, as our, we zigzagged around from one shot to the other uh, until we were blotto. Uh, there was kind of a routine to it. We would go into the cellar, uh, taste various wines, uh, get out, uh, go over to the side of the road and do you know what, and then get back in our cars uh, and go on to the next uh, chateau. And one night, 
Uh, among the people on the trip was a uh, rather impecunious aristocrat who, whose family had a broken down chateau uh, in the region. And so he asked us to, uh, to spend the night. And uh, there was no heat. So we uh, were, the way we kept warm was uh, sipping ma. Uh, you know what ma is? It's a white, fiery brandy that's made for the, when you finish making the wine, you've got the debris of the grapes and you let them ferment. And uh, just a word about our, our group. Uh, as I said, they, these were, these winos were a very pleasant pro group of bon vivant. And our, as our expedition wound down on our way back to Paris, it occurred to me uh, that they had never raised their pinkies swirled their glasses, or judiciously held them up to the light for examination. They smoked ceaselessly and swallowed their wine in a gulp or two, instead of sniffing it, rolling it around their tongue, and spitting it out, as professionals supposedly did. Nor did they resort to any of those precious adjectives uh, cherished by wine snobs, such as naive, diffident, presumptuous, frivolous, or ephemeral. Uh, they trusted their instinct, and they knew what they liked, and they liked, they liked what they knew. And uh, they really were great experts. And uh, I just, uh, I went along on that trip, incidentally, with a French photographer, a great French photographer by the name of Robert Duaneau, a very Parisian photographer. And uh, his, we did that, but it never appeared in print. Uh, but last month, uh, I did an extract of a chapter for the Wine Spectator, and we dug up those old photographs, and uh, so they were published for the first time. Uh, and I think they're, uh, they're quite lovely. Uh, I was uh, intrigued and captivated by crime, and, and uh, I had to cover crimes and, and trials, and I relied very heavily for help on... Uh, my colleagues, my friends in the French press, the crime reporters particularly. Now these were guys with marvelous imaginations. You know, they would describe a scene so vividly uh, that you would think they'd been there when in fact they were just sitting in their offices smoking their pipes or maybe sitting at home in front of the fire with their slippers on. Uh, uh, there, there was a, they had certain formulas uh, First of all, they would start off, uh, you know, American papers are getting this way. In the old days, you'd say who, what, why, when, and where in the first uh, paragraph. Uh, and the f American papers were adopting this French uh, practice of, it was a moonlight night as Monsieur Dupont made his way down the cobblestone street, you know, turned to page 84 to find out what the story is. Uh, but that's the way the French wrote. They were born, uh, they were, uh, they, they want to be novelists in a way. And I think it's no coincidence that, uh, that George Simenon, the author of the wonderful uh, Maigre novels, began his, uh, his career, his prolific career, as a crime reporter. Now, these reporters all had these uh, marvelous uh, formulas. Uh, if the woman was plain, uh, she was called handsome. And if she was just passably good-looking, she'd be called ravishing. Uh, and uh, they had no compunctions once somebody was, a, a, a suspect was, was held to label him the odious assassin. Uh, and uh, I was particularly spellbound by uh, uh, crime passionnel, crimes of passion, uh, which uh, was something of a French spe specialty. I suppose it happens all over the world, but uh, there is a unique quality the, to the cream passionnel in France. Uh, I'll give you an example. In 1952, uh, I covered the sensational case of uh, one a woman called Yvonne Chevalier, who murdered her husband. Uh, he was the mayor of Orléans, a lovely town in the Loire Valley, and he'd just been uh, promoted uh, to a post in, uh, in the cabinet, a junior post in the cabinet. He came home on a Friday night uh, to announce to her, to Ivan, that you know he was delighted this was his first cabinet position. But of course she knew that he was carrying on with the neighbor, the redhead next door, 
Uh, so she took out a revolver and shot him. Uh, took her children down, to, left her children with the concierge, and then went over to the police station and confessed. Uh, but despite the confession, uh, she was acquitted. Uh, and uh, this opened my eyes to a rather singular French trait, uh, which is this uh, tolerance, understanding for human frailty. I mean, you know, she was an abused wife, and uh, it was a love affair, and passion had entered into it, and she sort of maybe lost control, or maybe she hadn't. Uh, but anyway, the, uh, I went up to the trial. The trial was moved from Orléans to Rouen because the sentiment was running very much in favor of Yvonne. Even though the mayor had been very popular, uh, you know, the newspaper reporters, of course, were the sob sisters, as we used to call them, were out in force. And, and generating sympathy for Yvonne, and, and they felt they couldn't get a fair trial uh, in, uh, in Orleans. So they moved the trial to, uh, to Rouen, to the lovely old cathedral city. And of course, the crowds are outside, you know, screaming, liberate her, liberate la, you know, and so forth. And, the, 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 and of course, she was. The, the judge, I must say, was extremely deferential to her. Uh, whenever she started weeping, he would call a recess. Uh, he referred to her as Madame, and, uh, and uh, he was practically on the verge of tears himself. Uh, uh, we could get into the whole system of French justice. <coughs> you can find it, more of it in the book, because there were other cases I had to cover, and uh, one of the things I learned that it was that, uh, you know, there's no habeas corpus in France. In fact, there's no habeas corpus in most countries except for the United States and Britain. And the practice was that you would uh, arrest somebody uh, on suspicion and then hold him or her in jail while the investigation went on. And the investigation could take a year. And uh, in some cases, uh, there'd be a hung dr a jury uh, and a new trial. And there was one case that co I covered in my detail in the book, uh, one of a woman called Mary Benard, who uh, was indicted, eventually indicted after years of waiting for the investigation of poisoning her husband. It served him a very uh, delicious dinner, by the way, but allegedly had arsenic in it. Uh, and uh, she actually uh, was alleged to have killed 13 people, but uh, all her relatives, uh, which might have been understandable. Uh, at any rate, uh, uh, but she was only tried for her husband, uh, her husband's uh, uh, murder. And I remember going to one trial, one of these trials, which was held in Bordeaux, where uh, it was going along and, you know, it was droning along, uh, as trials do. I mean, you know, it's not like television today with Perry Mason. It would just, uh, the trials take a long time. Uh, but there was a dramatic moment when her defense attorney, uh, was uh, questioning an expert who really knew about poisoning. And he held up a jar uh, with, uh, with some viscera in the jar. And he asked the uh, expert to uh, analyze it, you know, at sight. And the, and the expert uh, definitely identified these viscera as arsenic-filled uh, intestines of a human being, presumably Marie's husband. Whereupon the attorney said, my uh, cher ami, as he said, you know, they always laid it on thick. Uh, these are pig tripes. Well, that ended in, in a hung trial. The other trouble there was Marie went back to, to jail, and eventually she was acquitted. But uh, she'd spent seven years behind bars before that would end it. And, of course, when, that, when the whole thing, that, uh, the fiasco was over, uh, you had the usual commentators uh, demanding that the reforms of the judicial system and so forth, but it really hasn't changed very much uh, if you've been following the trial of uh, Monsieur Papon, you know, the guy accused of collaboration uh, down in Bordeaux. You see it's been, it's one of these uh, spastic things that keeps going on. They keep stopping it. He keep, goes back to the hospital. He comes back again and so on and so forth. Uh, fashion was not exactly my beat, but in 1957, uh, I was assigned to do a story on Christian Dior, who by then had emerged as the world's foremost uh, dress designer. Uh, 
And we operate as a group at time. You know, we call it time like to pride itself by calling it its, its operation group journalism. Although some of us used to call it grope journalism. At any rate, uh, we operate as a team. And, uh, and I left the finer points of the subject of fashion uh, to my more qualified colleagues and concentrated on Dior himself. And uh, one evening he invited me over to his uh, very fancy private house in Passy in the 16th arrondissement, very upscale neighborhood. And uh, it was, let's give you a little whiff of what it was like. Uh, it was almost suffocating in a way. Uh, The, uh, the, the place was just laden and, and uh, chock full of, of, uh, of uh, drawings and paintings and sketches and uh, impressionists, neo-impressionists, cubists, uh, whatnot. Uh, the shelves were filled with leather-bound volumes uh, and autographed photographs of... Uh, French and foreign dignitaries and, and actors and actresses and composers and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, opera singers. And the walls were made of a kind of damask, uh, vermilion damask. And uh, you would see uh, scattered around uh, ancient Greek or Chinese uh, antiques sitting on uh, ancient chests. Uh, he, uh, we talked for a little while. Uh, first, we started talking and sitting under, in front of the fireplace and drinking champagne and under the portrait of Dior, uh, not a very good one, I think, uh, by Buff Bernard Buffet. And then he realized, of course, that I was uh, there for to do a story, so he uh, told me to poke around, and I did. And I looked in, for example, I looked into the, uh, uh, into his bathroom, which uh, had a colossal. Uh, empire green marble tub linked it, link, lined in zinc and equipped with swan's head faucets. And the bedroom uh, uh, was furnished with a kind of crimson canopied bed, uh, a purple Louis XIV prix dieu, and mauve draperies and a white bearskin rug. Uh, anyway, uh, he realized, of course, that, that there was something absurd about all this. Uh, but he said to me, uh, you know, my friends uh, tease me for accumulating all this stuff, but uh, whether it's valuable or not, uh, I, uh, it inspires me in one way or another, and I, I think I regard it as my own flea market. Uh, we chatted a little bit about, uh, about fashion. Again, my, it's not, wasn't my specialty, but I wanted to hear what he had to say about it, and he said, uh, uh, I'm no philosopher. But it seems to me that women, and men too, instinctively yearn to exhibit themselves. In the machine age, uh, which esteems convention and uniformity, fashion is the ultimate refuge of the human, the personal, and the inimitable uh, from the most outrageous, even the most outrageous innovations should be welcomed, if only because they shield us against the shabby and the humdrum. Well. Uh, just to finish off with your, you know, he uh, he was not as uh, lofty as he was a good businessman. He was not as abstract as you might think. You know, he was one of the first. Uh, he pioneered the boutique and he pioneered the uh, ready-to-wear industry, and uh, had a lot to do with uh, with putting French fashions back. French fashions uh, had been shattered during the war, of course, and uh, he put them back on the map. Uh, now, American, Americans uh, tend to ridicule intellectuals as eggheads, uh, but in France they were venerated as authorities on everything from art, literature, and music to politics, economics, religion, and complicated social issues. Uh, here again, the streets, uh, we don't have a not to my knowledge, a boulevard uh, Faulkner uh, or an avenue Hemingway, uh, 
but uh, in France, the streets uh, bore the, fam the names of famous and forgotten novelists and poets and dramatists, and their busts uh, stood in parks. And you'd see their, uh, you can see to this day, their engraved portraits on banknotes and postage stamps. And crowds would pack halls to listen to their long and often incomprehensible talks. And gossip columnists uh, detailed their, their tastes, their quarrels, their love affairs, as if they were movie stars or sports stars. They mainly congregated in, in Saint-Germain-des-Prés on the left bank, uh, where they had their favorite cafes, the Floor, the De Magot, uh, or the elegant bar of the Royal, Pont Royal Hotel. Now, I lived in that neighborhood for uh, on and off for years, and one of my assignments uh, was to cover them. The assumption was, since I lived near them, I spoke French, I better get in there and, and cover that story. And uh, when they weren't in their cafes, they were in frequenting the local boîtes and the, you know, these little cellar uh, places like the Taboo or the Club Saint-Germain and listening to Juliet Greco and that husky boy singer who incidentally is, is still operating in Saint-Germain-des-Prés. Uh, there was another guy called Boris Vian uh, who, uh, who wrote, um, who played a jazz trumpet and wrote mystery stories and to, for the sake of verisimilitude he would, he would say that they were translated from, from the American, not from the English, from the American and they were kind of imitation uh, uh, Raymond Chandler uh, or Dashiell Hammett hard-boiled uh, detective stories. Uh, and I squeezed into many of the local distractions as I could, concerts and experimental film festivals and avant-garde theater premieres and vernissages at cheap uh, art galleries and receptions at trendy uh, publishing houses. It was all very exhilarating, I must say. Uh, but reporting on the intellectuals wasn't particularly easy for an American. Uh, with some exceptions, um, they were either die-hard communists, uh, the, 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 the uh, cultural czar uh, of the Communist Party, by the way, was Louis Aragon, who was a very well-known well poet, uh, or like Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir, uh, quite hostile to the United States. And, uh, the communists were marvelously uh, successful at, at getting a lot of uh, people, uh, uh, you know, famous names and celebrities uh, uh, to, uh, to demonstrate for their causes. People like uh, Yves Montand, Simon Signoret, Jean-Louis Barreau uh, were always out there uh, when they had demonstrations of one sort or another. Uh, these demonstrations uh, seemed sometimes to be ludicrous. You know, they were organized against Coca-Cola. When Coca-Cola first came to France, uh, the communists uh, concocted a, uh, a gimmicky phrase uh, calling it Coca-Colonization, uh, that, uh, you know, America was going to invade uh, France and destroy its culture with this soft drink. Uh, Hollywood movies were on the blacklist, although a lot of communists would secretly run off to see westerns. Uh, and another, the Reader's Digest, you know, which was translated into French, was uh, another example of this uh, American contamination of uh, French civilization. Now, the same, these same intellectuals are, in some ways, were absolutely awful, and they rejected evidence of Stalin's atrocities, and uh, there was one big case where they denounced a former Soviet uh, diplomat by the name of uh, Viktor Kravchenko, who wrote a book. Uh, he defected and wrote a book revealing the existence of labor camps in the Soviet Union. Um, there was another uh, very courageous French uh, left, leftist but anti-communist editor called David Rousset, uh, and he, uh, he was attacked for publishing a series of articles in his newspaper on the Gulag. Um, uh, Albert Camus uh, was an interesting case. He refused to toe the communist line and instead preached uh, some form of neutralism. And this led to his break uh, with Sartre. You may have noticed in the New York Times on Sunday, there's a new book out uh, on Camus, and uh, you can read more details about that. Uh, Malraux, Andre Malraux, was quite difficult to classify. 
He'd been a communist and uh, had had great adventures, which, of course, one read about in books like his novels like Man's Fate and Man's Hope. And at this particular time, he was, had become an advisor to General de Gaulle. So after uh, several requests, he agreed to see me at his house uh, outside Paris. Uh, and uh, by that time, I was living in that neighborhood, and I went over to see him. Uh, and I got there in the early evening and was ushered in by a maid into the den of his, which was strewn with books and papers and magazines and documents and mementos of his travels. And on the desk lay the manuscript of what I guessed to be his work uh, in progress, which is called Les Voix de Silence. It's a massive synthesis of uh, the world's art. Uh, Malro was a uh, short, dark, and weird. Uh, he had a black shock of hair hanging over his forehead. Uh, he was afflicted with some kind of a facial tic uh, that gave him a look of a mad genius. And uh, without indulging in any preliminaries, uh, he, uh, he lighted the Golwaz and started talking. And uh, the gush of his words interrupted from time to time by bouts of wheezing, uh, which were caused by his asthma. Uh, he began to, he did, never told you very much about his private life, and it re really remained a mystery. Uh, he hadn't, uh, unlike Sartre and uh, many of the others, he had not been very well educated. Uh, what he learned, he learned. Uh, wandering around the world. He was very un-French in that sense because mostly the French sort of uh, French intellectuals stuck to Paris and of course they could uh, ventilate about events going all over the world but they never went there. Uh, they never left their cafes uh, whereas uh, Malraux uh, did and uh, so uh, here he was rambling on uh, twitching, chain smoking and squirming in his chair and uh, I'm left with a kind of cryptic uh, statement that he made to me of, among the many things that I had in my notes. Uh, I recall one of them. He said, our ancestors understood their environment, which was circumcised by, circumscribed, I'm sorry, <laughs> by family, church, and custom. Ours is the first generation to inherit the whole wor world and we can barely grasp it. I have searched for its meaning all my life through concrete action rather than philosophy. What have I discovered? I'm not certain. Perhaps doubt. Maybe the next century will do better. Now, if you can figure that out, tell me. Uh, now, my pal, my pal and uh, fellow gin rummy player, Art Bookwald, uh, was better than I was at covering celebrities. But occasionally, I was handed the job. Now, one day, I moseyed over to, to the Ritz bar to interview Hemingway, uh, who had come to town. You know, he was the quintessential American in Paris. Uh, he'd been one of my heroes. And, uh, you know, everybody uh, knew Hemingway in Paris. And I must say, to this day, uh, Hemingway has become one of the icons uh, of Paris. Uh, you know, you stop in a little hotel and you look at the price list and it says single room, 500 francs, double room, 800 francs, Hemingway Suite, 1,000 francs. Uh, the Ritz bar that I mentioned has become the Hemingway bar and cafes all over the town have changed their, their names to the, not to the cafes, but inside they have the Hemingway table, the Hemingway bar and so forth. Uh, well, I went over to see him and I must confess to you that it was a terrible disappointment. Uh, I started off by asking him uh, about the Nobel Prize that he had just uh, been awarded. And uh, he sort of brushed it off. That little Swedish thing, I gave it to the mayor of Havana. You win your medals, but you don't wear them, he said. Then I asked him about journalism, because I know that he'd been, before he became a novelist, he'd been a reporter, correspondent, freelance correspondent for several newspapers. Uh, and uh, he just, again, 
in a couple of sentences, he says, every reporter needs a built-in shit detector. Uh, how about the Americans in Paris during the 20s? Gertrude Stein was a pretentious egotist. Scott Fitzgerald had doubts about his virility. John Dos Passos squandered his talent. And as he went on, rattling away, I gradually felt that this icon of my youth has degenerated into a caricature of himself, and my ears glazed over. After a while, visibly fatigued and slightly tipsy, he stumbled to the telephone, rang up his wife in their room, and slurred, for God's sakes, come down here and rescue me. <laughs> by, contrast, uh, by contrast, there was Audrey Hepburn. Uh, in July 1953, uh, she'd come to Paris to promote her first American movie called The Roman Holiday. And uh, I spent the better part of an afternoon with her in her suite at the Ritz. Uh, the, the whole, the, the interview had been arranged by her press agent and uh, who had obviously told her this was a big opportunity since uh, I came from Time magazine, you know, powerful magazine, and so forth. She had, uh, uh, so she came into the, she, she was trained to be a ballerina, and she came into the salon uh, pirouetting a bit, you know, putting on a little act for me. Uh, and she, she glided, and uh, I should say. And uh, I presumed immediately that this coquettish entrance was designed to dazzle me because of this time connection uh, and uh, her uh, this notion that she had that uh, time's influence could make or break her reputation which it might have uh, she glanced at herself in the mirror uh, then she gestured to me to sit beside her on a brocaded one of those spindly uh, sofas that they have in French hotel de salons uh, at first uh, she seemed to be totally poised. Uh, then she began to fiddle with her hair and fidget with uh, her dress and fumble with her cigarette lighter. And I sensed that for all her cool composure, she was as nervous as a kitten. Uh, little did she realize that I was so smitten by her, uh, her gossamer beauty, that she could do nothing wrong. And then she began to relax a bit and chat about her life. And she was totally charming. And... Uh, I walked out on, not on, on air, I walked out of the hotel on air. Uh, my infatuation naturally unrequited and uh, never saw her again except on the screen. Uh, now by the late 50s, France was engaged in war against the Algerian rebels and that was another area I had to cover. And in May of 1958, the situation exploded uh, when a group of French diehards ousted the French administration in Algeria, uh, in Algiers. Uh, I, at that particular moment, uh, I was on a fellowship at Harvard, the Neiman Fellowship, uh, but I dropped everything and uh, went down to Algiers, uh, Richard Harding Davis style, romantic style. The airport was closed. Time magazine had a lot of money, so I flew down to Rome, I hired, chartered a private plane. Uh, I flew into a little town near Algiers called Blida, hired a taxi, and drove into the city, uh, and walked up the steps through the Bougainvillea uh, and the Jasmine, the steps of the uh, marvelous Hotel St. George overlooking the Mediterranean. And there on the terrace, a bunch of my old boisterous friends are having a birthday party for a good-looking dame by the name of Annette Andrew, who happens to be sitting here. Uh, she was then the cultural attaché at the American consulate. And mobs, sort of angry mobs, had destroyed her, her center, and she was uh, hanging around, hobnobbing with these reporters who had come into town for the event. And she and I soon became an item, and after an indecent interval, we got married in Gibraltar. And shortly after that, I was reassigned as Times Chief Correspondent in Asia, and we moved to Hong Kong. And uh, let me just uh, finish with a theme that I wanted to stress, which is this theme of continuity in France. Again, this plus I change, plus I même shows uh, the French concern for, for continuity. 
In May of 1968, that's uh, an absence of 10 years, uh, I returned to Paris and out of nostalgia, I uh, dropped into the Creon bar uh, for a drink before lunch. The, uh, the Creon uh, bar, the bar in the Creon Hotel, was located next to the time office. And uh, in the old days when I was there, every day we'd go for a drink. Uh, can't imagine how much we drank in those days. Two martinis at lunch and a bottle or two bottles of wine at, uh, before lunch and two bottles of wine at lunch. Uh, and there in the bar, of course, nothing had changed. A few of my old colleagues were still there. And so was Louis, the bartender, his patent leather hair as slick as ever. Uh, without batting an eye, he extended a limp hand and mumbled to me, Bonjour, Monsieur Cono, back from vacation? <laughs> well, uh, I just spent a week in Paris and, uh, and could do a postscript on what the city is like today. And I guess I've exhausted my time, but if you want to get into that in the question period, it's fire away. Thank you, Stanley. We do have about uh, five to ten minutes for questions before we break up. And uh, if you, we have a microphone that will be passed around, would you please speak up so everybody uh, may hear your question? Do I have any takers here? While we're waiting, yeah. right here. Yes, now, would you wait for the microphone, please? Thank Why you. are the French so antagonistic towards us? I Did say, everybody hear the question? The question is, why are the French antagonistic toward us? Uh, let me tell you how I feel about that. The French uh, are not only antagonistic towards us and other foreigners, they're antagonistic towards each other. Uh, uh, you know, the French are very, they live in a very nuclear kind of society, you know, with family and close friends. And, uh, uh, and, and, you know, language helps you understand. Uh, when you ask a Frenchman how he is, he usually answers, je me défend. I'm defending myself. Because he sees himself surrounded by enemies. You know, it could be the, the neighbor, the tax collector, his mother-in-law, whatever. So the French tend to be, uh, it's not just anti-Americanism. There is, of course, a very strong streak of, 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 of xenophobia, a nationalism among the French, uh, which accounts for it for certain, in a certain respect. Uh, at the same time, uh, given the, 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 the French and the Chinese, I think, share one, one trait, which is the belief that they are the middle kingdom. They're the center of the universe, right? They are, they, they are imbued with this enormous sense of superiority. Uh, and they have trouble accommodating themselves to the fact that, that Louis XIV is no longer the king of France, right? And, and that, that the, the glories of the past have faded. And, you know, and therefore, uh, they very much want to, and they feel, of course, you see this, for example, in, in the defense of the language. You know, just recently in Hanoi, they had this, there was hardly anything in the American papers, I guess. I was away. I was in Paris. But, you know, they had this thing called the uh, conference of francophony, you know, francophones. I put the accent on a phony rather than the francophony. At any rate, they were all gathering there uh, in Hanoi. It was a it was a big congress of all countries that had been former French colonies uh, where they spoke French, and this was going to sort of validate this what remains of the French glory that all these countries are coming there and they all speak French. Uh, or not only countries, right? they brought people from some little town, some little town in Louisiana. Uh, or for some place in northern Maine, you know, where they're French Canadians. Uh, when in fact, it was all phony. I mean, phony was the right word for it. I mean, fewer than 1% of the people in Vietnam speak any French anymore, even though it had been a French colony, but you've you got to be over 60 to speak French. And it's true in other places, they're adopting English. So the French are reaching all the time for this, to, to, to recreate this, the glories of the past, the grandeur, la grandeur, and so forth. And Sometimes that gets translated into what would seem to be hostility uh, toward Americans. Uh, but I will say, you know, just to end this point, uh, I have French friends and there are no better friends I know. I mean, these guys are terrific. And just recently when I was back there, uh, you know, we were stumbling all over themselves. Everybody was inviting us to dinner. 
And now that, you know, now they live in fancy apartments, you'd actually go to their homes for dinner, not just restaurants. So it's a good experience. And uh, it may also be that they're journalists, and, you know, when journalists are, are a group apart, you know, in French, the colleague is confrère, and the word confrère continues the word brother. And so we are kind of a fraternity of people. But it's even true of French friends who are not journalists. Uh, so uh, anyway, that's my experience with them. And there's a little bit of, you know, it's part of all the contradictions of the French. Other questions? Yes. What were your feelings about de Gaulle? Well, um, I, uh, I was at the beginning, as, first of all, I was a reporter. I wasn't supposed to have feelings about things, right? I was supposed to report the story as I saw it. Uh, at the very beginning, uh, de Gaulle was president of France in 1947, just after the war. He was president of the provisional government. And then he stepped down because he didn't like the constitution that was passed. The constitution that the French passed uh, gave authority to the parliament, and he felt that unless there was a strong central authority, uh, that France couldn't be governed. And he was absolutely right. The Fourth Republic, this parliamentary system, was an absolute disaster. Uh, it was a lot of fun and games, but it was turnstile politics. Governments were rising and falling. And de Gaulle started his own party, and he began to embrace all sorts of people. Now, even though he had been, uh, you know, the head of the Free French, uh, you began to have a lot of collaborators coming in there. It became a uh, rather extreme right wing. Uh, and, uh, I mean, for, to the extent that I had any opinions, they tended to be knee-jerk liberal. And... Uh, uh, I thought that, you know, he, would, uh, he had the possibilities of being uh, somewhat dictatorial. But I must say that after the Fourth Cor uh, Republic collapsed and he was called in, uh, there was something f faintly ridicule about de Gaulle, as, as even, you know, as the caricatures uh, of him show, you know, this great lofty figure with his hands. Uh, but he was a brilliant man and uh, really pulled things together. And I would rate, among many things he did, the one thing he did was to, to end the war in Algeria. Uh, I mean, he did it, you know, he advised us when we were in, in, immersed in the, in, the, in the Vietnam War, uh, he, uh, he made a big speech in Phnom Penh, which incidentally I, I covered because by that time I was out in Asia, in which he said, you know, if you have any sense, get out of there. Uh, and nobody listened to him, of course, we thought, you know, he, he was just this big loudmouth frog, you know, who was telling us that, uh, to get out. We, we suspected that he had ulterior designs, that he wanted to get French influence back into that part of the world. Uh, but he was, the problem, and the problem is now that the, the country is suffering to a certain extent uh, by his, uh, his disappearance because the Constitution was written for him. And, uh, you know, you can't, you can't really take a constitution that was written for one guy and then pass it on to somebody else. And today we have this peculiar system of a right-wing president, conservative president, and a socialist prime minister. And it may superficially resemble our situation, you know, with a president of one party and a Congress run by another, but it's not the same. It's, it's much different. And uh, so anyway, uh, but the goal... One thing, finally, I must say about de Gaulle, he was a great stylist, he was a great writer. De Gaulle's memoirs are beautifully written. And that, again, is very French. You know, uh, even the, some of the most tin-horned politicians, uh, French politicians I knew, were terribly well-educated and great writers. Yes, ma'am. I think we have time for one last question, and then we'll continue in the dining room. I was surprised by the, your description of a crime of passion favoring the woman. Because uh, if you rem remember the Code Napoleon, in the Code Napoleon on divorce, a man could get a divorce if his wife had an affair. A woman could only get a divorce if her husband brought his mistress into the home. Conjugal bed. Hmm? Conjugal bed. Yes. Right. And, um, and, I, and I thought it was just generally understood. There's some expression about la midi uh, <laughs> set. Yes, uh, f for men, they all it was understood that they generally had. You're right about that. I mean, it's affair. true that it was a 
it was very much a, a, a man's world uh, in those days, and may very well be today. Uh, and uh, the sympathy for the crime of passion, I mean, it probably could have run both ways, but it tended to run for the woman. And this is a little bit beyond the law. But you're absolutely right about, uh, about divorce laws. Uh, but the French didn't want to get divorced. I mean, divorce... Uh, divorce was, uh, you know, was, was undermining the pillar of the society, which was the family. And therefore, instead of divorces, uh, you would have the understanding that, uh, that everybody was having his affairs on the side. And as long as they were all kept discre discreet, uh, people accepted them. Uh, of course, everybody knew what was going on, but nobody talked about it uh, because you didn't want to. And that the, this case I mentioned was quite unusual because normally Yvette Chevalier must, you know, should, Yvonne Chevalier should have accepted the fact that her, her husband uh, was having this affair. Uh, but the redhead next door, by the way, was, uh, was sort of flaunting it a bit, making it. Her husband, of course, her husband knew about it. Uh, and I guess uh, really Yvonne felt that she was getting, uh, you know, being mistreated. He was, very, he was a very tough guy. He was very tough on her, uh, as I can, in, abusively, I mean, in, uh, you know, speaking to her and so forth. So uh, anyway, uh, it was, as the, as the crime reporters would say, it was a nice case. <laughs> I think that uh, the time has come when we uh, should adjourn and uh, move uh, to our informal reception. I think, Stanley, you have illustrated that uh, the quest for international understanding has its lighter moments. And, uh, and uh, this has been a, a very entertaining walk back to a, a wonderful era. Uh, and, I, and I know that, uh, that uh, Paris uh, like, remains very much a part of your life and, uh, and, and also one of the great uh, times of your life, as I think it was for, for so many of us here. Uh, I, I was there on Monday uh, having dinner in Paris, and I can tell you, even now, it, it's still a wonderful town. And we thank you for taking us back to Paris in the 1950s, and now you're all invited to join us, and the book is here for the author to sign. Thank you very much. <laughs>